Let's go back in time to 1932 as Congress brings you historic footage of the legendary original Celtics with whom all great professional teams are compared. We have now taken over your radio. Richie Guerin is about to show you the most important step in getting past a man. It's the first one. And Oscar will inbound it. The men in green, the Milwaukee Bucks, that's Al Cinder against Bellamy. It has Jordan. Allen shakes Gray gets two. Gilmore on to go in the first quarter for the Cow Palace. Here's Barry. Jordan. Open. Chicago with the lead. Hello and welcome back to the Over and Back Classic NBA Podcast. I am Jason Mann. With me as always is uh, Rich Creech. And we have uh, Adam Cribbley joining us again to discuss uh, Bob Lanier. Uh, he was a center from 1971 to 84 with the Detroit Pistons and Milwaukee Bucks. Um, looking at the some of the advanced stats overall, he is 49th in win shares, 48th in win shares per 48. He is 18th in box support plus minus, and that's post 1974, so it doesn't count for three his first three years. And 47th in value of replacement player. Um, shockingly enough, he never made an All-NBA team, which which seems crazy to me. He was an eight-time uh, All-Star, so certainly was considered one of the top-tier uh, big men of his time. He finished third in MVP voting in 1974. On uh, Looking at some of the other uh, lists uh, on the uh, Bill Simmons Pyramid, he is 92nd. And in the Slam Magazine 500, he is uh, 62nd. Uh, all the time. Uh, he has five seasons in the top 10 in win shares for 48. Uh, he has four seasons in uh, top 10 in value of replacement player. We don't normally look at this because this number sometimes is a little problematic, but I just thought it was interesting because of how high he is. Nine seasons where he's in the top 10 in PER. So, um, it, you know, the kind of the, the negatives for him is that his teams, particularly the Pistons, didn't have much playoff success. Uh, he had a lot of injuries, especially later in his career, which kind of limited his, limited his ability to stay on the floor. But he was just a, a, a great inside-outside scorer, a prolific defender, just a, you know, really great big man um, for his time. Um, so, Adam, uh, what do you think of Bob Lanier's case for the top 50? You know, I, I love Bob Lanier. Um, l- looking back, he's been one of one of the, the hidden gems from the 70s that unless you're a Pistons fan— uh, or I guess maybe an, an early 80s Bucks fan, you just don't know much about Lanier. Uh, and I think a lot of that is because his career is overshadowed you know, by the, by the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He, he's not an all-NBA uh, all first team or second team. And his Pistons teams were, with the exception of maybe a season or two, they were pretty much you know, god-awful horrible. And so uh, Lanier's been a lot of fun to, to kind of get to, to watch and, and look at. He had a couple uh, different careers almost. Uh, early in his career, he was... He was quick and he could run up and down court and he could finish and he could dribble, you know, uh, handle the ball on the break. And then by the end of his career, you know, if you watch his days from the Bucks, uh, he reminded me a lot of you know, a lot of kind of a, a mid 80s, late 80s uh, Sam Perkins. You know, he had that kind of smooth lefty jumper and could get people in the air and drive by and, you know, score near the rim. But early in his career, he was a really good athlete. Uh, before some knee injuries and stuff. So watching him evolve in his career and then emerge as kind of this um, cornerstone of some really good 80s, you know, early 80s Bucks team has been really, really fun to kind of figure out that that transition and also to to, to really figure out how how good he was. Yeah, that transition that you mentioned is really interesting. I mean, yeah, he really – there is a stark difference between the two, and he just dealt with – I mean, he basically began his rookie season fresh from knee surgery. He later had seven more knee operations, and then um, he didn't play um, – any more than 70 games for uh, you know basically the last 10 year, years of his career with one exception so you know just was bad on the injuries that obviously slowed him down although he as you mentioned was still effective you know was still a you know had a strong role on some very good um bucks teams in the uh, in the early 80s and um he also I mean, he had a great hook shot too. I mean, not quite the sky hook, but it you know it, it wasn't far behind. I mean, he just had um, 
you know, watching him is really, really enjoyable. Um, a couple of things that don't really, that just kind of were notable to me, even though they don't necessarily have to do with the top 50 cases. One, um, like, there's there's video of how like distraught he was when he found out he was being traded from the Pistons, and they were like in the middle of like a a 16 win season. They were about to you know I think they would be getting Isaiah in the next draft and you know transitioning to the um the the next team. But you know the Pistons had been bad you know since the mid 50s um really since since they moved from Fort Wayne. So you know for basically 25 30 years, I mean they were uh, a bad team, and he you know always gave it his all to try to win and just to see him like um just the feeling that he had of um you know just missing Detroit or just not feeling like he was able to deliver or whatever um made that happen just kind of stood out to me and also um my uh my stepdad did uh he he worked uh sound at Gund Arena for the um the 50 greatest player ceremony in uh Cleveland and he said that Bob Lanier was by far the nicest uh player uh that that he dealt with in um in in all that time so just a uh just a small note about uh Bob Lanier's uh kindness well, actually, you bring that up, Jason, and I, I think we might have seen the same video as well because I, I saw the clip of him doing that. And then they also showed a clip. I think it was like an interview. Uh, it was like an inside Pistons. I forgot what exactly the, the thing was. Yeah. But uh, he actually was getting choked up talking about how he was so disappointed in himself and so disappointed in, his, in, in a lot of his like life you know, that, that he wasn't able to do more with that Pistons team, with, the, you know, with him and Dave being in the 70s Pistons. And like you know, he said he's so emotional about what he feels like he let everybody down. or like I, I don't know his exact words, but he was just like – you know, he was like getting overcome and like they were doing this interview and he was just like, yeah, I just I, I I'm just disappointed and I, I just wish we could have done more. And I know we could have done more. We just never did. And it's it's it, it's a unique sort of approach. And it, it's you don't often get that with guys. I mean, you get guys sometimes that will say, yeah, that team that, you know, we should have done more about whatever. But he's like still in this interview was not that long ago. And he was still just like, yeah, I, I really wish we would have done more. And and really, you look at those teams and you wonder how they don't do more. And that's kind of a question that comes up with Lanier. Not that I think it. it I'm not usually one of those people that says, oh, well, let's let's look at why, you know, his teams weren't successful. It must have been because he wasn't, you know, a good enough star or whatever. But you look at those teams and it's like, man, they really should have been better than they were. Yeah, they had like one strong year in 73 uh, or I think 74, actually. Um, yeah, I, they were just kind of kind of like a revolving door when it came to uh, players and um and and coaches and stuff. Um, yeah, coaches were, and, were in and out of there. Yeah, <laughs> like a yearly basis. Right, exactly. I mean, yeah, the, the best they kind of did was in '74. They were 52 and 30, and they went to seven games against the uh, Bulls that season. And they made a few playoff appearances um, later on in the '70s, but just kind of kept. Um, they actually made the second round in '76, but for the most part, uh, they would you know they, they would lose pretty much in the first round. So, um, and by '78, they were done the, the, the 79 dick vitale led um team which um which actually had uh which had ml Carr and i think chris ford in it which is funny that like two guys who were you know not doing much with the pistons ended up being like important players in the celtics just a couple years later so one of those weird uh like uh, just one of those weird like concept context dependent things i guess sort of like uh iman jumper and jared smith being key players for the uh the bulls this year I'm <laughs> right. the Cavs this year. Uh, real quickly, uh, going over uh, some of his VAT stats, and then we'll talk a little bit more uh, about what we kind of think of him as a top 50 guy. Uh, comparisons to era and position. Uh, he's fifth all time uh, amongst his era and position in uh, points per 36, uh, 44th in rebounds per 36, 18th in effective field goal percentage, sixth in win shares per 48, second in win shares, and second in value of replacement players. So he definitely stands out. I mean, obviously, a lot of those number twos, a lot of the second places are all the Kareem. I mean, Kareem basically, you know, outclasses them in a lot of ways, as Kareem does to basically everybody that ever played the game. So that's not uh, a big surprise. Uh, overall, though, all time with his position, he's 13th in points per 36, 103rd in rebounds per 36, 70. Uh, 72nd in effective field goal percentage, uh, 16th in win shares per 48, 11th in win shares, and then 8th in value of replacement players. So the uh, the advanced stats do like him a lot, uh, and a lot of it is the scoring, but a lot of it is is the win shares as well on both ends of both offense and defense. And and that's something we haven't really talked about yet. Is his defense was uh, it was good? Yeah, he was a he was a really good defender. Um, at least early in his career. I think later he suffered from the the uh, the knees and the mobility. He but, couldn't jump. Yeah, yeah not at all. Uh, but you yeah. know he was able to push. To kind of push Kareem away from the hoop a little bit, and uh, you know, obviously Wilt Chamberlain and those guys gave him some trouble, and and so did the some of the 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 Dave Cowens type that could sit on the perimeter and force him from the rim. But he was, you know, to use kind of a modern term, he was he was a rim protector. He could defend defend around the rim. He could uh, 
you know, could intimidate a little bit. He also had this, you know, reputation as being a badass. And so people didn't want to mess with him when they came in the, came in the lane. Um, I think he said he, I read, read in a Sports Illustrated article, he got in maybe one or two fights in his, in his rookie year and then, uh, no one messed with him anymore. So he, you know, he had this reputation and people go into the lane and, and I think would, you know, would, would maybe think twice before coming in there. So, so you make a great point. I mean, he was, he was an offensive player, but he was also a really good defender. Um, you know, especially in a, in a time in kind of a golden age for NBA centers. Yeah. And, um, I, I, yeah, some of the video, um, I, I think just shows like he, he, him being such a young athletic shot blocker and just being able to, you know, cover the floor. And I, I mean, the, the advanced stats, you know, particularly the, um, you know, the, the box score plus minus uh, does show, you know, does hint at a strong defensive value. Um, so I, I think personally that he probably has the best case to have been upset about not being on the original top 50. Was he in that the um, I know we were talking with the Dantley that he was in the, the Dantley was in the next 10 was Lanier in that next 10 group. I'm pretty sure he was. Okay. Yeah, let me find out. Yeah, for I, sure. I'm almost positive he yeah, was. I'm, yeah, I'm almost positive he was. I got it right here. Um, uh, if not, then we gotta storm the. Yeah, I. I <laughs> Sakaka, yeah, New yeah, Jersey. He. Um, oh wait, a minute. no. This is the next ten. Okay. Um, this is good podcasting where we can uh, <laughs> where we can. Uh, well, I think I, you know while you're looking that up, I think Lanier would be actually ben- would benefit too from the first couple seasons in the league. They didn't even count block shots. They didn't keep that as a, as a statistic. Right, right. right. Yeah, exactly. So when, uh, you know, the first season it's kept, he's third in the league in block shots. And so you wonder, and that's already, you know, his fourth year in the league when he'd already had, I think, five or six knee surgeries. And, you know, so you wonder how many he's blocking in his first two or three years that even bump up that resume a little bit uh, if kind of some of those statistics are taken into account, the the blocks and steals. Yeah, yeah. Um uh, you know, I can't find it for whatever reason. Yeah, I can't either. Uh, well, I, I found that he was one of the voters, but that's all I can find. Yeah, so, uh, so. I, yeah. Well, either way, he is definitely in that club, and um, and yeah, I, I think he he, and maybe here, Dominique. I think probably the two that you would be like would probably have the uh, best uh, case uh, for. Quick question for for either one of you. Uh, we we saw we kind of talked about it at the beginning. It, what do you think hurts his resume the most, or at least hurts his perception? by a lot of people is it is it the fact that you know he he played in an era where there were so many other guys that were playing you know his position that were you know you got kareem you got well you you have those sort of guys that are there you know at least in the beginning or the the tail end of their career that were just so good at it or do you think it was the fact that he played on bad pistons teams and and even though he played on good milwaukee teams it's still detroit and milwaukee you know what i mean like it's still these very small market teams at that point uh detroit hadn't really had the renaissance yet uh milwaukee had is still kind of the forgotten team of the eighties. Is do you think that affects it, or do you think it's more that, or, or is it neither? I, I don't know. I kind of think it's a little bit of both, but I don't know which is more strongly. I, I would assume it's more the positions of like playing next to Kareem and those sort of guys, and not quite being as good as them, which is not really you know something to be mad at. But yeah, I mean, I would think I, I, I would think it's probably just a combination of not quite you know, uh, of just because there's just two or three centers just ahead of him during his time that he didn't really get those all NBA recognitions. And, um, and probably even more importantly that he didn't play for, you know, a power team for the most part in his career, never made the finals. Um, and just, you know, um, and even when he was on the good team, when he was with those Bucks teams, he had a small role in in those teams. I mean, he was still he was important, but he was not the star anymore. So, um, I, I would guess that would have more the, the most to do with it. I, I agree. I think it's the fact that his teams weren't weren't real good. Um, I think he he suffered by comparison to the to the Kareem Abdul Jabbar's. You know, he came out. He was the first mm-hmm. pick the year after Kareem, and so I think there was that expectation that he would do for the Pistons what Kareem did for the Bucks. And, you know, Kareem's second year in the league, and he's he's lifting a trophy. And uh, Lanier's second year in the league, and the Pistons are out of the playoff contention by February. So I think that uh, that he, he suffers, but I think it's I would I would agree it's it's a lot of it's predicated on that team failure. Yeah, for sure. So, um, anyone have anything else? Yeah, I have I have one thing. I was I was kicking around. I was looking at some of these similarity scores on Basketball <laughs> Reference. And the one I the one that I kind of la- my eyes went to was Patrick Ewing, and I think that there's a lot of a lot of similarities. I didn't you know look at the advanced stats or anything, but 
kind of the way that they played a little bit. Some of their teams, you know, that Ewing never wins a ring. Lanier what never wins a ring. And I, Ewing's, uh, I would say Ewing's Knicks teams in the '90s are better than than Lanier's uh, Pistons teams in the '70s. But I think that there's a comparison there that they're kind of both players suffer by comparison. You know, Ewing is is regarded as probably the third best of the the Elijah Wan, um, Robinson you know Ewing trio and and Lanier kind of maybe the third best of the Abdul Jabbar Cowens Wilt Chamberlain whatever you know he's kind of always the third or fourth best in the league and I think that there's a there's something to be something to that comparison that that uh that Ewing and and Lanier kind of have these very similar career arcs um although Lanier didn't you know get traded to somewhere and you know embarrass himself like Ewing with the with the magic <laughs> but um other, other than that there's a pretty similar co- uh, career arc I think yeah uh, and I think the style that they played, I think also, and they did have similar strengths and, and, and skills. Um, I, I, that's a good point. I was actually going to bring that up too. So I'm glad you, that you did. And um, I, I do think that, um, yeah, and, and Ewing's obviously benefits a little bit from being um, in New York. Um, although maybe the, the other side of that is that um, New York gave him expectations that, that were hard for, that would have been basically impossible for anybody to meet, especially when they're playing against Michael Jordan. Right. <laughs> so. You know, I also love the uh, – so Lanier also gets the dubious distinction of winning the first uh, – NBA's first and I think one of only two one-on-one contests. Yes. And I, I was trying to find it, video of that. I kept I, seeing like yeah, stories about it. Is there YouTube. video of that? Uh, yeah. um, I tried to find it. I could I saw, not find uh, it. Yeah, I, 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 I think you have to just search Lanier versus JoJo White because it's those two. Okay, because that's the matchup I was looking for. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't find it. Damn it. <laughs> like, that <laughs> no, sounds like the greatest thing ever. It's horrible because you know uh, there's this whole <laughs> tournament and uh, they're trying to crown the best player. And the tournament itself is kind of a farce because a bunch of the you know the, the Jerry West and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's and Oscar, you know, they don't even play. Uh, Pete Maravich got knocked out by Lanier in the first round. And so <laughs> – if you look at the – I don't know why they seeded them that way, but you know, if you watch this last game, it's the most god-awful basketball in the world. It's, it's like a, you know, an adult playing a kid because you got 6'11", Lanier, and I think JoJo White's like 6'3". And so every – They're just backing him down. And just like... He just backs him in and then a short little turnaround or a layup, and then JoJo has to shoot a 20-footer, which only counts as you know, a point. Um, and so, I mean, the game, it's, it's god-awful, and the, the fans are kind of half-heartedly cheering, and then uh, – when Lanier won his won the tournament, um, Bob or uh, Bill Russell delivered him his prize, which was a gym bag full of dollar bills, and it kind of reminded <laughs> you know the uh, the the wrestling comparison obviously is you know Andre the Giant getting you know winning the Body Slam challenge, and uh, he gave you know the the Bill Russell gives him this this duffel bag, and it's all one dollar bills because it's a one on one tournament, so he's got fifteen thousand dollars in singles. Um, to uh, as, as his prize, so yeah, this oh, the, isn't real. This is not real. You're making this oh, up. There's all, no way. This all happens. completely real. And that's and you know, <laughs> Bill Russell's cackling the whole time, as only Bill Russell can do. You know, handing over this duffel bag full of cash. And now the only thing that would have made it better, of course, if Lanier goes into the the crowd and starts throwing up the dollar bills, and uh, Bobby Heenan runs out and grabs the <laughs> yes, uh, full circle. Yeah, exactly. So no, that's that's priceless. You have to find that. Um. So I found um, I found the next ten greatest players. So um, so Lanier is not on there. It's it was done in two thousand and six. So it's it's Kobe, Duncan, Garnett, Connie Hawkins, Iverson, Kidd, Bob McAdoo, Reggie Miller, Gary Payton, and Dominique. So for the record, see, I think I think uh, I think Lanier makes it over Hawkins. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to, if you want to kind of consider the, you know, the issues with Hawkins being blacklisted and, you know, and, you know, not being able to be chosen, you know, being out of the league for several years because of that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I think I, I would have picked, I, I definitely think Lillian would make my top sixty. He might make my top, my, our top fifty. Who knows? It's, it's close. I, I another one where, um. Uh, you know, another one where, you know, again, just be, be behind so many great guys. But I mean, the numbers do look really good. I mean, that's 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 a helpful thing. And, you know, the anecdotal evidence suggests that, um, you know, he was a pretty great player. So it, it, he, he's definitely one I would strongly consider. Great. Definitely. All right. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, checking us out. And you can. um 
We're at harvardparoxysm.com, and you can find us and all the other great um, uh, Harvard Paroxysm uh, Network uh, podcasts. Um, you can find them there on iTunes. Um, we also have a uh, pod center where you can uh, you can play any of them that you want to, and um, you can find us uh, also at overandbacknba.com, our forums where you could chat about any of these top 50 players that we are uh, talking about. And you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at overandbacknba. So uh, until next time, thanks everyone for listening and goodbye.